Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. If we could, uh, we still have a couple people running late, but um, I don't want to hold you up uh, too much longer. So if we could, we can get this started. What I'd like to do is um, get this um, program started. I'd like to welcome everyone here of the municipalities and um, the, the uh, members of the General Assembly. Um, it's great that you all could make it here on a Friday morning. Um, I just had word that somebody was thanking me that we're not doing on Saturday because of hunting season, so I guess that's a good thing. So <laughs> They would like to continue these meetings on Friday morning. So if we would um, start from uh, myself and go around um, to my right doing introductions, I'm Larry Dodd with the County Council. Paul Wilbur, County Attorney, and represent a few towns too. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> Laura Hurley, um, County Council Office. Bill McCain, Hawaii County Council. Abby Everett, Senator District 37. Um, George Chester, Tall Bay, Caroline, and Hawaii Comico. Mary Beth Carosa, Senator <laughs> District 38, half of Hawaii Comico, all of Worcester, and all of Somerset counties. Uh, Johnny Mounts, House of Delegates, District 37B, Tall Bay, Caroline, Dorchester, Wacomico, uh, co delegate with Delegate Adams. Wayne Hartman, Delegate 38C, representing uh, Northern Worcester and Eastern Wicomico. Charles Otto, Delegate, House of Delegates, uh, District 38A. Nicole Ackley, Wicomico County Council. David Robinson, President of Mortal Town Council. Amelia Handy, President of Town of Hebron. Colby Fippen, Commissioner of Town of Hebron. That's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Joe Mangini of the Town Manager in Pittsville, Grants Administrator for Willers and Sharptown. And I live in Somerset County. <laughs> <laughs> okay. David Carosa, Pittsville Town Council. Uh, Delegate Chris Adams, District 37B, Talbot, Dorchester, Caroline, Wacomco, and also House Minority Whip. All right. Uh, you know who I am. <laughs> Carl Anderson, Jr., uh, Delegate uh, 38B, Wacomco County. You get all of me. I'm not shared with anybody. Uh, you know, uh, Wicomico House Delegation Chair, which means they're all the local bills that come through here. We take them to Annapolis and, and uh, get done what we can. But it's really good to see these meetings happen again. The last one that I was a part of was in 2006. Um, these are introductions. I know, 2006. <laughs> and so it's just it's great to, to be able to bring everybody together again. Thank you, Carl. Yeah. Ernest Davis, Wicomico County Council. Josh Hastings, Wicomico County Council. John Pesota, Acting County Executive. Uh, John Cannon, my comic County Council at large. Thank you, everyone. And I, I um, don't want to miss anybody, but I, I do believe Mr. Carroza is one of the newly elected town council members from the town of Pittsville. So congratulations and welcome. Is there anyone else that's newly elected? Okay, good. And to the audience out there, thank you for your interest and thank you for showing up this morning. Miss um, um, Senator Carroza, I believe you wanted to make a, a statement. Uh, uh, thank you, um, Mr. President. Um, first of all, I wanted to echo my colleague, um, the chair of the Wicomico County Delegation, Delegate Anderton, on, on these meetings. And I know we have a list of issues which I think are very important that we work through, but I just wanted to make a comment um, early on um, as we go into our um, first our special session and then our regular session. I was looking at these list of issues and, um, you know, these, these are priorities. Um, I serve on a committee, the Senate Education, Health, and Environmental Affairs Committee, where we receive the highest number of bills for consideration in the entire Maryland General Assembly. The reason I'm sharing that with you is to the extent that we can get early information from the municipalities and from the counties um, to us, um, it is extremely helpful. And what I'm talking about is even when we have a hearing, I often will ask my uh, staffed, have you contacted MACO, Maryland Association of Counties? Have you contacted MML, Maryland Municipal League? I'm also aware that the smaller municipalities and the smaller counties sometimes do not take the same position as MACO and MML. So I also want to make sure that we're contacting you directly and you're letting us know. And the reason I'm putting this plea out before we get into these specific issues is um, 
it's it's going to be important, especially this session, the fourth year um, in an election year, this session's going to be fast and furious. So, you know, this is, we will try to, as, as issues pop on our end, asking you, the delegation's asking you to the extent that you can give us early information on your priorities, whether they're in line with MML or not, it's very helpful to us so we can work together on the priorities. So that, that, that's why I wanted to, I asked to make a couple comments and looking at this, this list of issues, um, you know, we, we will have our challenges. Yeah, uh, Senator, I agree with you. Um, unfortunately, the way it's been in the council, and hopefully we can make changes, but it seems like the items don't get to the council office until like the last minute, and then that's when we submit it to you. So maybe we can submit what we, what we have to you in advance and then keep submitting as they come in, if that's okay. Yep. So. Okay, um, starting on the list, um, one of the first things that has hit the council is um, a salary increase for the orphan court judges and um, in October uh, a, a letter of support was sent from the county council and the um, county executive's office. Um, so is there anyone that can elaborate on that? Yeah, we're, we're looking for your support. I'm sorry? Are you, you all are paying for that increase? I think that's the state. It still has to be approved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but I mean, whose budget has come out? When, You're, I think you were. <laughs> <laughs> My question would be back to the council. Um, normally when you have a, a request like this, um, is it is it statewide? Is this gonna, yeah. is this a statewide yeah. request? Or no, this, this is, is for this our orphans court okay. members. Okay. And and when was the last increase? Is that in here? Miss Hurley. I think it's your budget. I think it's like eight years ago. I know it was maybe two terms ago. Eight says eight, years. Eight, says eight years. Eight years. Okay. Eight years. Okay. That's helpful to know. It, it, it's in the letter. It's it's just say letter. no. I know you haven't had time to read. That's okay. Yeah, I think it's I think it's one of those weird ones where it goes to the state, the state pays the county, it ends up in our budget. Right. Yeah. It comes from the state law. Right. Yeah. Thank you. It is. But um, delegate. I just you know with regards to orphan orphans court, you know there is a uh, entity, there is a group that's trying to uh, change the way orphans courts operate. I don't know if you're speaking loud enough. You might need to speak in. Uh, with with regard to the issue of judges and orphans courts, I think it's also important for the county to keep a close eye. There is a um, group. Uh, there is maybe this is it's a little bit more than rumor, but um, there is an effort to change the way orphan courts operate, which I, I don't support at all. However, it's coming from the Western Shore, and um, there's a report that's going to be issued, or it may be out already, that I think. Um, for those who are supporting the Orphan's Court, um, trying to lift up the Orphan's Court, that you're also aware of that report and that you're ready to um, be prepared because there, there's a, a movement to try to change orphan, Orphan's Courts. I just wanted to make okay. sure you're aware of that. Yeah, I don't think this body's heard about that yet, but I imagine we will. It was, um, I'm pretty sure the uh, qualifications for the Orphan's Court of those judges and that was part of the issue when they raised the qualifications in some of the counties a lot of the smaller jurisdictions balked at that and said we can't do that because we're not going to find that level of qualified person to do this so that um has continued to that movement has continued to grow so it may be tied into this exactly. okay all right mr hastens just so it said for anyone who's paying attention on PAC 14 or any else, the, uh, this the Orphan Courts of Wicomico County, they, uh, their, their group, they came to us. This has been uh, something that they've talked around at the state level with other counties, but the, the salary going from 9,500 to uh, 11,600, uh, they did say when they came before us that they've had to spend more time during COVID, a lot more outreach, and of course, this is a small amount of money in the eight years since it's been last changed. 
uh, and, and of course a lot of uh, a lot of costs have gone up in the meantime. So um, I think it's, it was also thought by the council this is obviously this is not a significant amount of money, but at least it is an increase. Uh, so only to eleven thousand six hundred for anyone who doesn't have the letter in front of them. So. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. And they did uh, convey to us that they do a lot of work. They spend a lot of time in the office, and um, they're very busy. So it, it's not very good pay for all the time that they invest. So. Do you have any more comments? OK. Um, Ms. Bradley, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm sorry. I'm Michelle Bradley. I'm one of the town commissioners from Hebron, and I went to the GOV building instead and then okay. came here and then walked in on whatever was going on with the hospital. So I apologize for being You're not late. the first one, so yeah. <laughs> so welcome. <laughs> Thank right. you. Next on the list, we have um, the eviction legislation. Mr. Um, Cannon, would you like to lead this? Yes, this is a, a legislation that we've tried a, a more than one time to get through. Last year, we had the problem with the council itself as far as getting this to the state of Maryland. I'm hoping we will resolve that this year and bring this back. Um, as you're very familiar with this, uh, Delegate Anderton has been very helpful. Uh, so has uh, Senator uh, Eckerd in trying to get this forward into the state of Maryland. It passed unanim unanimously through the House of Delegates, and it simply got held up in committee with, in the Senate. Uh, a couple of other things, uh, uh, Center for Public Justice uh, created a lot of issues with it, mostly being that they wanted an additional 10 days notice for the uh, tenant expressed to them that 10 days notice this notice proper notice we felt was already in place all we wanted to do is just lock the doors and keep the possessions of the tenant from being thrown out into the yard which in effect went blow down the street um, it also was more efficient for the sheriff's department they could be there they could they could lock the doors and say the job is done they wouldn't have to sit there for two hours for everyone to bring every piece of furniture out in the front yard uh, you wouldn't have to have the city of Salisbury or any other municipality then coming in and saying, uh, you know, writing citations because the, the, what is now trash is all over the neighborhood. So we felt this was a much cleaner approach for an eviction process uh, as, as, uh, as difficult as it can be. We thought it was a much cleaner approach to allow to pass a state law where we could lock the doors on an eviction, leave the property inside <clears throat> instead of having to be forced to take everything, televisions, couches, whatever furniture there might be, put it in the front yard. So that was, that's, it's cut and dry. We just want to lock the doors. So we're going to bring that back again. And um, probably to it is the fact that we realized that when uh, renters move in, a lot of times they'll go to renter center or some other uh, uh, rental agency uh, for a TV or for their furniture. Well, we're putting that out in the yard in an eviction. And then all of a sudden, Rena Center is has a problem where their TVs are being stolen or the couch is being stolen. And who 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 falls victim? That's the tenant. They've already been evicted, but now they're probably going to get an invoice from Rena Center or wherever else because now that TV is no has been stolen. So I think it's a win-win, and uh, we're going to bring that back up again uh, with the uh, with the help of um, I hope hopefully with the help of the uh, Eastern Shore delegation. John, can you? Refresh my memory. Did, did we set, did the council vote on a letter of support for that? No, the council did not vote. Um, there was, I believe, a three-three tie. Uh, Joe Holloway abstained. Um, but that was when we were in the middle of COVID with the evictions and. No, it was when we were. I don't know. It was last session, last le legislative it's session. Usually, the bills don't move forward unless there's. A letter of support out of the committee so that Understood. may have been what helped move up so oh might, that's what stopped it last yeah, yeah last year so, what I'm saying. right so revisit that and make sure there's a strong uh, group of folks to testify when that comes through this time. Understood. okay yeah right. Ca councilman I I would just uh, echo what you're saying I'm also a property owner who has to go through these uh, experiences with with tenants and it's never a, a pretty thing to have to go through this technical aspect of dropping everybody's personal possessions out on the, the street, but that's what's required currently. So what you're after is, is much as we can be uh, humanitarian about this uh, effort, this goes toward that. Frankly, I thought this bill, this, this was one two or three years ago, so that we've had a couple goes. We didn't bring this last year, though. No, last year, yeah, right. Last All right. year we did not. Or if we it did, it just didn't. Okay, so so we've had some success in years past, and 
my memory of this is there may be other jurisdictions that are actually do what it is you're asking to do. So Baltimore City does it. Yes. All right. So there's no – this isn't groundbreaking in so much as uh, there are other areas in the state of Maryland that agree with the general principle that there's a uh, – what you're doing is honorable uh, within the context of when somebody has to be evicted, uh, what we do with their possessions. It's, it's never a pretty thing. This would go toward – I'm speaking circular. I like the bill and I would support it. It also has an impact on the, the sheriff's department as far as uh, their resources and, mm -hmm. and at, at time when they're removing the property. So, is this just for rental evictions or foreclosure evictions or just rentals? Just um, just yeah, it's just for rentals. Okay. Yes. President Dodd, could we put this on the agenda for the next council meeting to get a letter of support? Sure. Yes, delegate. If I could add, and um, Councilman uh, Cannon had mentioned, you know, the um, having the support last year it, on several issues, it, there was a lot of back and forth as to the support and, and where it is amongst the council. So when we go through these issues, if you could start off by letting us know, you know, where it is as far as at the county level with, with you. And the you know if it's been voted on the amount of support that it is because as, as senator Ack eckert had stated we, we really need that that strong unity from from the council and you know then it, it saves us a lot of grief within the delegation as far as supporting something and getting it done i mean we're, we're here to serve the majority so whatever side is coming on i don't care if it's the majority of the people that's what I want to. That's what I want to do. So, that helps a lot. If you could clarify where we are as a council. Thanks. Any more comments? I'd like to welcome um, Speaker Pro Tem Cherie Sample Hughes. Welcome. Good morning. Thank Good you. Morning. Good morning. Good morning, y'all. Morning. So if there's no other comments, we're going to move on to um, the electrical board uh, legislation. I know that is something that the Senate, uh, the state just passed, and there's some concern locally. And I'll take that. I've spent yes. um, some time with both our local electricians and with um, the bill sponsors, and I know Delegate Mounts has as well. Um, the my understanding, at least the latest update from um, my conversation with Delegate uh, Hornberger, who was the sponsor on the House side, and with uh, my last conversation with Senator uh, Corey McRae is that they are committed to a technical corrections bill to address uh, the concerns that have been raised by our local electricians. I have specifically requested a copy of the draft legislation um, so we can share it with our local electricians so we in fact can confirm that the technical corrections bill addresses those issues and doesn't do any further harm. So I have not seen the draft legislation at this point. We will share it with both um, the county um, and our local electrician groups and, and ask for your feedback before we would move forward. So can I add uh, to this? Uh, yes. So I'm, I'm in business and I do work with electricians and it appears, and we're just talking about Wakamaka County, obviously this is a statewide bill, but it appears that the local electricians have been satisfied with the counties uh, working with them. And it appears also, and, and maybe share some light on what's happening, but the Department of Labor, which is the licensing um, entity, must be working uh, with our county to facilitate this. In other words, there were some electricians just saying, well, we're not going to, uh, renew our license based on this application. We don't want a master's electrical, electrical license because they're never going to use it. But uh, it appears that there's some work that is happening cooperatively. Maybe you could share that with me a little bit. Or maybe is there anyone that can elaborate on that? <coughs> Paul, can you, can you crystallize it? That, what, well, stay <laughs> that. Okay. That's it. I, I like the part about how, how this county, quite frankly, is looking at it. Uh, from a common sense perspective and, and the, the mandate approach that we have in place right now appears to be working. Yep. We do have a band-aid <laughs> approach right now. That would be accurate as to what is going to happen in the future with this technical correction bill. I have not 
Uh, I have no knowledge of what they're planning to make uh, corrections on. But the big issue was we had local licenses we tested for, we granted, and now the state essentially wants to take over all the licensing and testing mm -hmm. and discipline. And it's, uh, I'm not sure the state's staffed up for that. I think it will be well um, cumbersome. If, so if that's what that is, I don't see how a technical corrections bill actually solves that. That's a major alteration mm -hmm. from where the bill was It is. So it's, it's a I mean, sea change of how licenses, electrical, I mean, let's, let's just say Chris Adams wanted to be an electrician in Wacomico County with this bill in place. I mean, I would have to get the, the most rigorous uh, license that would allow me to do almost anything as an electrician. Maybe I'm only interested in residential uh, work. Maybe I don't need the commercial aspect to it. Right. And so what was happening was it was causing local electricians who did not want to do, you know, uh, more difficult commercial style work to just say, the heck with it, I'm not going to participate. Now, I don't, how do you fix... Maryland's bill because that, that basically puts it back to the locals to, to create their own definition of what a master electrician is, what, you know, the different lines are. So <laughs> it was a bad bill from the start. And I, my only comment was the locals seem to be very, very satisfied with what's happening in Wacomico County. I'll, I'll leave it there. <laughs> Delegate? Yeah, and I just, I think the, uh, uh, Recognition should go to the uh, the people in the industry and the trade, the electricians, because they've been under enormous uh, demand right now right. with what's going on um, in their trade, uh, and they're trying to decipher and provide recommendations on this legislation, and, um, and, and they're in a very precarious situation because they have to negotiate with their own regulator. Um, and, um, and so anything the county can do to continue to help um, the electrical board and, and the members to make sure that everybody knows that, you know, this is being discussed right now and it's going to affect everyone in the trade and everybody in construction, generally speaking, um, because when the bill is introduced, it will be complicated. Um, and as Delegate Adams mentioned, um, there are so many um, intricacies uh, around this issue that we may need the county actually to help the electrical board you know, to be hand in glove when we're debating these things. So when there's a bill on the floor, we can say with um, uh, with with all the authority that we can from our local jurisdiction, this is either not fair or it's not safe or it's against the best interests of what we're trying to do. Um, we'll, that would be very helpful. We're going to need that uh, because there is a big political push behind what's happened in the electrical trade. And if we don't have that uh, political counterbalance from from uh, from, uh, from our areas, it's not gonna it, it's not we're not gonna have the effectiveness that we're gonna need. So, can, can I just add to that? Jo Johnny and I served on the committee where this bill was heard, and a lot of the debate happened, and we saw it live. But let me just put a bow on it. In Wacomico County, the bill, if we don't like fix it, and it's more than just a, a fix, it allows say an electrician from Washington County to show up in Wacomico County and do work. It's a statewide election, which gives the locals no control over the quality and the safety of it. Or, or, if, or maybe I should say not no, but it gives it very little. And it's thrown to a state agency, and the way Delegate Mouch puts it is, to what degree would we have to grow this department to have a rigor for the quality of the applications and them actually getting the license? That's why this bill is unworkable, and that's why the locals are so very upset about it. Delegate. If I can add, um, representing Worcester County, I think what they're doing, it, they had about 50 general electricians, I believe. Some of them aren't from the county. Um, so they're, they're actually giving a test for the difference of the residential work. They're testing them on the uh, commercial and industrial work. I think their, their plan is to um, convert as many of the masters as possible. Um, just to caution you, some of the other things that you had mentioned, the discipline goes away from the county. So if there's somebody that, you know, deserves to have their license revoked, the county can no longer do that. So to me, that's a concern. Um, it takes away local control. Mm -hmm. um, you would have to go through the state to have a, a you know, any discipline or license revoked. And it also sets up uh, complications down the road where there's going to be a study for low voltage, sprinkler systems, 
uh, our landscape lighting, cable TV, that all may need to be done under a master electrician in the future, which is really going to add expense to projects and, and further complicate things. So, as, as Delegate Adams said, this bill is not workable. The, you know, there's, there's so many challenges with it. Um, I just hope we can, you know, when it comes back, um, Delegate Hornberger, you know, he, he's in, um, some I've shared with numerous times, you know, the challenges with the bill. Hopefully, you know, we can make, you know, make it better, but it's, it's, it's on a, a, a road that's kind of, at this point, hard to. And, and with the low voltage, we've heard from the um, local alarm companies that they've had a lot of concern about the um, uh, regulations as well. Sure, so it's going to complicate all of that. Yes. Uh, did someone on this side have their hand up? I, I was just going to say, uh, how, how might MAKO be playing a role in this? I would assume they That's what I was going to say. I think you all, as smaller counties, need to get together and have a discussion about this and then work through MAKO and work through the municipalities or look to, to be able to see if you can impact. Yeah. yeah, MAKO supported the bill. Um, okay. and, and so yeah, as a member of MAKO, right. I, as Wacomico County, I would be calling them to task yeah. um, and saying, you were involved in creating this mess, now get involved in fixing the mess. And listen to us, listen to our electrical boards, because the electrical boards are professionals. They're not a shill for the industry. You know, they, they do a great job and they're experts. And, and they were cut out of this discussion, and, and MAKO should be a part of talking to, to all of them. Yeah, it actually surprised me on MAKO, but let me do it. If the idea here is we passed a piece of legislation last year to advance safety, this bill fails in that regard. There might be other reasons why they did it, but it wasn't because we made the industry safer for, for Wacomico County. This is one of the bills at MAKO that, that they didn't get 100% buy-in, so not everyone voted for that. I would encourage Wicomico County to talk directly to Queen Anne's County Commissioner Jack Wilson, um, who also was involved in the, uh, I believe his formal title might be the Electrician's Board Chair. So he was dual-hatted with both his knowledge um, and experience as the Maryland Electrician's Board Chair and also being a County Commissioner from a shore county. So I would encourage you to have that conversation direct, directly with him and then give us that, that feedback. Then that could be helpful as far as involving MAKO. I think that's a good point. Thank you. Do we know how many general electricians we have in the county that... Um, Does anyone have that number? That's hardly do you recall. Not off the top so, of my head. It's over 150. Because we meet in with them occasionally. Over 150. Yeah, it is. And that doesn't include the people that work for the general electricians. Right. right. All right. Nothing else. Moving on. <clears throat> Next on the list, we have the opioid litigation settlement. Um, we had a an update um, at Tuesday's meeting. And um, Mr. Wilbur, is there anything you'd like to mention on that? Because I know there's been some concern about the... Legis uh, legislators. I think there's a concern on the county's part that the state uh, wishes to keep most of the money, whatever money that would be, and not it not trickle out to the local jurisdictions, to the health departments for uh, local programs. No. The state seemed to take the view in a, a conference call with uh, Mr. Frosch that. Uh, it would only go out to the smaller jurisdictions if their um, opioid treatment program satisf satisfied the state. So it seemed to be state in control, not the locals in control. That's but an issue. As it relates to that, sir, um, the state, excuse me, the county still has the ability to put in for the settlement before January 2022. Mm -hmm. right. So it's still at your prerogative. It's not where. Um, it's, a, it's a mandate to say you can't do it as a jurisdiction because you have opioid programs. I understand the benefits. So to that end, um, personally, I would go from the angle of this is uh, something the county is capable of doing mm -hmm. and then move forward. Mm -hmm. 
everything doesn't work for every jurisdiction. And while you have that conversation with, you know, Attorney General, it still does not um, uh, say that you can't put in for it. And, and that would be what I would do. The state is anticipated to get about $500 million uh, from this settlement, um, from those three distributors. But at the same time, our jurisdictions have the ability to put in for the settlement. And of that $500 million, the less jurisdictions that participate, that number goes Absolutely. down. And it seems like the large jurisdictions are not interested in participating. And, 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 and to uh, Mr. Wilbur's point, that, that is the point, that, that if, if we take some of the larger jurisdictions, Baltimore, Baltimore City, mm -hmm. uh, Montgomery County, if they come out of the suit, uh, then it, it lowers that 500 million significantly. So, uh, I, and this is a great forum to, uh, to to clarify that, so that we have this understanding. That I don't want to, the cre the impression being created that if we don't uh, if, if we don't say that we want part of that settlement, that we're not doing anything in regards to the suit. Uh, uh, we're going to continue to look and see what the best interest is in, uh, for the county to get the most benefit. And I think that's that's basically the perspective that we're coming from. Is that correct, Mr. Wilbur? Yes. Sure. I just wanted to be known that it's not where you cannot put in for it, if that makes sense. Um, and then the last thing I'll say about that, we did pass legislation um, that would specifically direct the funds from the settlement to go to prevention throughout the entire state. That was adopted probably about two years ago and while we we're in session, and that was the, um, the, the focal point for where the funds would go back into uh, prevention for this issue. Right. Any more questions or concerns? I, I would just yeah. add, there's going to be additional resources coming down both for mental health and for substance use and abuse. So I think what's really important is to make sure that your local jurisdictions have good plans in place and are ready and able to take advantage of the timelines when pro proposals are requested. When there's a request for proposals locally, make sure folks are staying on top of that to be able to take advantage of everything that might be available. Do we have any idea of what's going to happen um, with the General Assembly with this opioid uh, litigation? Well, the funding will be presented in the budget, and we've right. already had preliminary budget things on that about what the thinking is, but um, and then anticipate other funds that are coming in. I know I sit on the the um, the Behavioral Health Advisory Committee, so. We, and I'm on the planning committee, so we take a look at all of the funds that are coming into the state at the federal level, both for mental health, because we have two different pools. We have SAMHSA monies for drug and alcohol, and we have mental health monies. They're not put together mm -hmm. at the federal level, which would be helpful to us. We put them together, but we have to satisfy all of those objectives and requirements of each one. So we have to match those all up. And then you have uh, the opioid litigation settlement that's over and above that. So I'm just saying that there's that fund that will be worked through the budget, but there also are other monies coming into the state. And a lot of times if there's a need, that gets shifted, again, according to the need. Okay. Any more questions or comments? I would like to welcome our colleague, Mr. Joe Holloway. He was running a little late. He uh, I, I apologize. Uh, we lost a firefighter down in Willards, and I uh, needed to go to his service this morning. Um, so, anyway, we. Uh... Thank you, Joe. Um, if, if anyone from the um, the city and town commissions want to chime in at any point, feel free. I know uh, it's the first time for some of you all being at this function, so um, you're more than welcome to chime in or ask any questions. So, Are there any more questions on opioids? Okay, moving on to um, broadband. The state's response and projects. Uh, Senator. I'll jump in on that. Of course, the most important thing is, and you all know this, is that all the counties have a plan in place and are working together uh, with the state to be able to move forward 
on taking, um, engaging as many providers as possible. We passed several pieces of legislation um, to make sure we can get those funds out to the last mile. And there were several boards that were created and those folks are being put in place as we speak to be able to make sure <coughs> the distribution of funding and the projects through each of the jurisdictions are moving along pretty quickly. And I think you've all had a recent meeting. We did Tuesday. We can't, yeah, so that's good. And yes. we will continue to make sure that those funds yeah, get allocated. <coughs> what we're facing right now, and all of you have probably faced it, is bandwidth. So a lot of folks aren't, you know, um, like for the Waterfowl Festival, at the Waterfowl Festival, there were so many hits to the website that it crashed. Yeah. Um, and what we're finding in a number of places that you're just not able, you know, it's body coverage. So that's going to be another issue we've got to take a look at. But. Right. We've recently met with uh, Maryland Broadband, um, Chop Tank, and in the last two days I've had two other uh, providers contact me, wanting to meet with us. So yeah, we're up. I want to say we're on top of that. So, um, Senator, did uh, you have another comment? I just wanted to expand. First of all, I want the entire Eastern Shore delegation made broadband um, expansion a priority. Especially, we have the challenge of making sure that we in rural areas receive our fair share. So, what was very enlightening about um, the COVID-19 is that. Um, our colleagues on the other side of the bridge um, also, I think, for the first time, really engaged on broadband expansion issues, knowing COVID brought to light that we needed it in all aspects of our life, um, telework, telehealth, education, you know, consumer convenience. So we did, this delegation, um, Senator Eckerd, um, uh, the Speaker Pro Tem and others in this delegation really push on these broadband bills um, and then we went forward with Senate Bill 66 which was the D digital digital connectivity act and with the joint trenching and fee <clears throat> I guess the reason I wanted to give this update and continue to kind of put the challenge out to both our municipalities and to um, the Wicomico County is that we will still, we still need to make sure that as all this money is coming down from the Fed to the state, that we again focus on making sure in the rural areas that we're receiving those broadband funds. That will be a continued challenge. So if all of us can get on record with that, um, you know, we've got the Maryland Rural Association, individual, MAKO, MML, but specifically for us making sure it comes to our rural areas. Yeah, I, I remember around 2002 um, we were talking about broadband back then and I remember having discussions with Senator E.J. Pipkin so it's going on 20 years right, right. Um, but I've seen a lot more progress in the last couple of years so I 28 years <laughs> and, and, and if I can piggyback on that yes yeah. uh, one could argue that there's a reason why we have so many pockets of unserved and underserved broadband users and that's because economically it's not feasible so we've identified, uh, just again for clarification, and this is, again, this is great, that we can clarify what it is from the ground, from the rubber meeting the road application level, what we're seeing here. Uh, there is a uh, belief that there is all kinds of broadband money raining down uh, to the uh, counties to, to implement this, right, from the federal government to the state. That's not the case. Uh, our, our pots are right now, the American Rescue uh, Plan money, as well as the grant money that was just released from the uh, governor's uh, broadband uh, or internet office. Uh, those are the pots that are available. In regards to, to the um, rescue plan money, we're being extremely careful on how we're going to, to spend that two tranches of $10 million, uh, 20 total, uh, over the next four years. Uh, so, so that's over here. In regards to the two grants that just came down, uh, uh, the, the first grant is uh, uh, one to uh, $500,000. We're not going to go, quite frankly, we're not going to go into, the, uh, into that grant pot because that places the county into the uh, managing of that grant. Uh, we don't have the resources to do that. There are other counties that do, but we do not. Um, uh, 
Then you have the one to $10 million grant. Uh, to that end, today or Monday, we will be releasing a request for proposal uh, to we have identified nine areas throughout the county that uh, are the highest uh, degree of uh, unserved or underserved. And we're going to say to uh, prospective ISPs, which are vendors, uh, by the way, so when we have them come into council, we have vendors coming into the county, we, we, into the council. We need to be very careful when we do that. Mm -hmm. We're asking uh, vendors to, to uh, submit to our proposal how they can best uh, deliver uh, broadband to these areas. At right now, we're looking at uh, a letter of support, as the grant says, uh, for them to uh, install that last mile. So I want to say, and I think I can say with quite a high degree of confidence, that in, the, in our region, we are, despite not having a broadband department, on top of broad, broadband. I challenge, quite frankly, any other county that, that uh, says that they uh, have engaged any more ISPs or any other entities regarding the uh, uh, implementation of broadband. So we're on top of it, and we're going to stay on top of it. But we also want to make sure that the taxpayer money is well guarded, and, and as we watch the free market system take uh, hold and deliver to these areas. Could I just ask the nine areas? You mentioned yeah. an RFP went out for the nine areas. They, Can we clarify going, the nine yeah, areas? Yeah, it's going to go out today or Monday. Can you, you can, so you can't share the nine areas yes. at this point? Uh -huh. I just, when you mentioned that, you're saying an RFP went out. For, no, it has not gone out yet. But it will go out for these nine areas? Correct. Uh, it, in fact, when it goes out online, those, those nine areas will be identified. So instead of, I, okay. uh, the, the map that I have uh, it speaks in generalities as sort of one through nine with a few uh, areas actually named, but uh, it will be uh, online when we put that out. And we'll get a copy. Absolutely. Great, thanks. That would be helpful to us. Yeah, and also, uh, share with us any <coughs> hard dates on anything. I know when we were meeting like Tuesday, there were some dates came out of that meeting that for some of this grant funding that have to be met that were like deadlines. Yeah, yeah some deadlines See, that, that are That's up. in the RFP as far as it, it references the yeah. grant. But if they come from the state, let us know as well. Absolutely. Speaker. Um, sure. I, I guess a couple of questions that already been asked that I was going to ask you, um, Mr. County Executive. I, and what I want to highlight specifically, the town of Hebron, in, in case in point, they are struggling <laughs> with even having um, the ability to maintain um, uh, the ability to be online, the ability to make 911 calls, they want to be connected to the emergency system that we have here in the county. So um, I'm pleased to hear that the RFP is going to go out, but I just wanted to raise that point because that's a safety issue that we're struggling with. I know um, we met with the Chop Tank and they've started in some pockets of Hebron, but I just wanted to raise that uh, to a high level of where our issue here in the county with broadband and lack of is really becoming a safety issue. Um, and so that's important to me. And I wanted to also ask you, moving forward, being broadband is a huge issue throughout the entire state, but more so in the rural counties. Do you foresee a rural uh, broadband coordinator for the county being hired? Because we need to capture the funds and make sure we're working with all those entities, the Comcast, the, the uh, Verizon, and all of those, um, but needs to streamline. Who will be able to do that for us? Right, <coughs> right now through the county, I, my, my IT director is that person. Okay, well, it, it, what, what that suggestion is to me is growing government to, at, at a point right now we don't need to do that. My IT director is on top of, again, is on top of everything that's coming down on broadband. To, to your point about safety, safety is my number one goal. I believe government's role, absolutely, the priority role is, is person safety as well as their property. Um, and, and I understand what the, uh, the, 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 the role that uh, broadband plays in that. But by the same token, uh, there is a, a uh, economic component on this that has to be considered as a reason why it's not in those areas. So we've taken, again, uh, we, in doing this, uh, we have, since for over a year, we've asked ISPs to provide us with their coverage maps. Some are, some are covered under uh, NDAs. Um, so 
but we know <coughs> where the trunk lines are. It's that last mile that we need to try and, 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 and thread that needle. And we're watching the free market system take this over. Another thing that's not being considered here is uh, the group Talkie. Talkie won a federal grant to implement broadband in many areas throughout this county. Uh, and so, you know, uh, they're out there too. Um, so we're on top of it. Uh, right now, we don't see the need to I increase the size of government by hiring a uh, director of uh, broadband. And to what Mr. Pesota said, my district exactly. has a uh, quite a rural area that did not previously have broadband, and Talkie has already come and is starting to connect in that area, in the Tayasca, Vival, Manicoke area. So I, I think what you're saying, I, mean, I support what you're saying, that it's, it's a free market and it's going to happen. And we're already seeing, too, uh, it, as the free market takes hold, uh, we're seeing uh, in, uh, installation times decrease. Uh, where we heard, you know, okay, it's going to be five years. We're hearing that that time frame for implementation being decreased. Right. The goal that's is 2025. That's the law that we passed. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I, that's and that's kind of where I was coming from. If you believe that your IT director can push that, do whatever is needed in the county, great. But I knew that we were on a timeline to make sure that people are connected. There wouldn't be uh, additional. Um, uh, times where we would not be able to meet that goal. So yes, it is 2025 so, uh, by 98 percent. And, and to clarify what I'm saying, uh, we're aware of where the trunk lines are. We're 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 aware of where the backbone is. It's that last mile. So so we we know where these pockets are, and the ISPs. We don't want to, from my perspective, from the county executive's office perspective, we don't want to use. You know, taxpayers' money, be it uh, the governor's money or, or uh, Uncle Sam's money, we don't want to be, it, ultimately it's our money, so I'm trying to safeguard that. If the free market system, if these ISPs are going to do it uh, on their own, uh, that's the perspective that, that we're taking. Keeping in mind, we want to make sure that, again, telehealth, education, that those uh, uh, needs are met, absolutely. Can I ask a, a follow-up question to that? Um, Ms. Bradley. Thank you. Um, um, to Speaker Pro Temp's point about the timeline and needing um, possibly that position, and to your point about not wanting to grow government, is it possible to use some of those funds to hire someone on a contractual basis just to help um, IT with this um, expansion uh, and the broadband work? And at the same time, I wanted to ask you to kind of go back about that other pot of money that you said we weren't going to touch because the county didn't have the capacity. Almost kind of the same question, would it be possible to hire um, a grant management firm or someone like that to kind of help facilitate? Because I hate to see the county lose any money um, if areas are going to get neglected. Um, it wouldn't necessarily be growing um, the county government staff and their budget, but it could be like a contractual position of, of sorts for either one of those. Um. Uh, the, the, the premise of what you're saying, uh, we're not neglecting implementation of broadband. Again, we're on top of this. <laughs> we are on top of it. Uh, and to, to whether the, the, the funds allow, which I believe that they do not allow, and I'll double check that, but that I believe that we've looked into whether or not, just as with a lot of things on the American Rescue Plan, we are getting, if anything, we take away from here. If you guys can get us guidance on uh, clear guidance on what we can use the American Rescue Plan money for, that would that would be great. Uh, but we're we're <coughs> we are taking a very cautious approach in in, in the use of those funds. Uh, I, I understand what you're saying as far as looking into a grant funded position. At the end of the day, it's it's a grant funded position. We th there are only so many avenues right now to pursue, I believe it would be uh, an inappropriate use of funds uh, to, to do that. We're on top of what we see real life and what's going on on the ground as to achieving the goal of delivering broadband in those areas that, that need it. Absolutely. I would, I, would ask, I would ask if I could, John, uh, for the benefit of the Eastern Shore delegation in case they, you know, quite often they're helping us with a lot of initiatives. As clarification, the RFP you're, you're, you're referencing, is that 
part of the $15 million grant that I believe has a deadline in January where the county would also be responsible for maybe $750,000? Yes, I, I'll be honest with, with that, with those numbers and, and what uh, uh, that vendor was was uh, uh, talking about. I, I'm unclear as to that, and, and you know, to to a large degree, once we start talking about the county putting any match in, you know, that's when I start to take a cautious approach, uh, because at the end of the day, who wouldn't want a business model that says, hey. Let's have the let's have the, uh, uh, the the taxpayer put some put some money in the game, and then we you know we get people to hook up and, and pass. There's no return on investment for the for the taxpayer. That's the approach that we're taking right now. As far as those particular numbers, I don't know those. So with the RFP, what project is that for specifically? Because I'm assuming it has to be for some grant related project. Yes, it's for the it's for the grant. Uh, so so here, here's the scope of the proposal, which has not been released. But uh, it, it will be either today or, or, or uh, Monday. The Maryland Office of Statewide Broadband recently released the Connect Maryland FY22 Network Infrastructure Grant. The purpose of this request for proposal document is for Wicomico County to review and potentially award a letter of support to be included with the application to the Office of Statewide Broadband, identifying an internet service <coughs> provider as a non-legally binding partner of the county for the purposes of this grant application in accordance, in accordance with the terms and conditions and specifications set forth in this uh, uh, solicitation. So we're saying, hey, you come to us and you say that you can <coughs> quickly, efficiently implement broadband to these nine areas that we've identified in a map which will be included in this RFP and you get a letter of support. Which grant application is it for? For which grant? The grants that were just recently released by the uh, statewide broadband office. They, okay. they, I, I haven't seen them. There, from what I understand, from, from the brief, I think there are two, aren't there? One has a very, has an immediate deadline and then the second one I believe has a January deadline. You're talking about the ARP? Grants, yeah. rescue plan funding, uh, no, no, or specifically um, broadband, broadband yeah. funding, broadband. Okay. Anyone familiar with with those? And, and not to put anybody on the spot, but you know, my my understanding is you're going to get specific money for broadband, but you also have other pots of money that are ARA funds that right. you could use to match with that and what? put together because exactly. that's what the infrastructure money is there for. Right. Well, the suggestion was, I guess, maybe with the ARPA money that that's where our, the 750 would come from the county. But I'm I'm referencing these two grants that were shared with us. And, of, and I think those, John, are the are the the, the, the one to five hundred thousand dollar grant, and then the million to ten million. I don't know about the 15 million. Uh, again, I'm I'm not that far in the weeds on these, okay. but I have a pretty good handle as to what we're doing, and that is. We're taking an approach to let the free market system take care of this and, and try and safeguard the, uh, the, the taxpayers' uh, uh, hard-earned money. Um, Mr. Pesota mentioned um, Talkie. Uh, Talkie has, oh, I, I did want to mention that Talkie has reached out to us again, and um, they will be coming forward. Mr. Um, Davis. Cherie, you said by 2025, what a percentage of the county has to be the state is the goal is 98 percent in the state or in each county we would we, we're the state office or it, we look at things just specifically the state if there is a breakdown for counties in in the bill I specifically we'll have to go back and look at that but it's 98 percent for the entire state is our goal okay. that's why the 300 million and the mm -hmm. other funds that um have come down the pike, and that is also a reason why we streamlined, I think, uh, Senator, you sponsored that bill, right? Streamlined the um, office so we could have information for funding only <coughs> in one area and not all over the place. Uh, Senator um, uh, from Washington County, Kim Edwards, he specifically had the same concern that we did in our community, in the rural community. I'm saying all that to say we streamlined it, we put the money in, and we put a goal of 98% for the entire state. So what that breaks down for each jurisdiction on where they are in that percentage, I don't know. That's why I was really concerned about making sure our county right. makes that goal with uh, someone who is focused strictly on that. The reason I say that because 
I hear what Mr. Pesota is saying that the, the 10 million that, that are, the RFP is going for, how much is that going to cover the county? And that's going to be our problem. And regardless of how you want to protect the taxpayer money, the county is going to have to put money into this. I mean, uh, with, I with, Maryland, to differ there. with Maryland Broadband and with Chop Tank, they both specifically said that we're going to have to put some money in. And if you go to any other county, Worcester County just had a, they just did a groundbreaking in Worcester County. I forget where it was in Worcester County, where they brought on 30 people online and they had to put money in the pot. You're gonna have, we're going to have to put money into it. It might not be a lot, but we're going to have to put money into it. To do what? To, I, I tell you, what's that going to accomplish? Because that's part of it. When they apply for these grants, we're going to have to pay part of that money. Matching. Matching funds. They sat right there and said it in front of us. Well, that's what Chop Tank said. Chop well, Tank and Merlin Brown. Merlin Brown. Because the ISPs want, they, they, they want that. We're watching it being implemented without having to put taxpayer money into it. Of course they say that they, they, they want, uh, that, that we're going to have to do it with a match. Well, <laughs> so, uh, we're, we're behind eight ball because. No, we're not. We're the only county. No, in the state we that hasn't ahead. got any money and we from also this, have we, we, we're, we're, we don't have an IT division some some of these uh, counties have uh, uh, departments with uh, a lot of people in them uh, and have had them for years uh, we, uh, um, I was um, listening to the debate back and forth now I don't remember this I'm not that old. Oh, yes, yeah. you do. But anyway, uh, back in the 30s when um, there was a lot of people that didn't have electricity in the rural areas, they came out with the company that came out and put in run electric. I forget what it was called now. I think, I think that was a prelude to Chop Tank, really, RF, RFD or whatever it was called. But there was only nobody was doing that at the time. So the government had to subsidize to get that done. In this case, right now, we've got four or five different companies that's chomping at the bit to get into business. So, so let them compete, and their competition will keep the prices down for the citizens. Now, I don't know whether they'll need propping up from the government or not, but to just go throwing money out there at them, let them do their work, let them do their groundwork, and see how it works out. It's not going to all happen overnight anyway. And, Sheree said it was what 2025 we had mm -hmm. that's sneaking up on us I know it's, right, getting, it it's getting closer exactly. all the time <laughs> but like John said the council is monitoring we've had had um, some of these providers in at different times so to just go all out and say we're going to give you money to do this and do that let you know competition is one of the best things in the world for any business and I think they'll um, they'll show us how that works so. um, the Board of Ed has already um, spoke to us and said that virtual learning is not going away. So um, the question I have, you've mentioned the nine pockets. Does that reach the last mile for everyone? Or is there still going to be some areas that won't be getting broadband? Uh, are, 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 you talk, are you referencing? Uh, it, <clears throat> let's see, the short answer is no. Not everyone in the county is going to get broadband. Uh, okay. Not everybody in the county wants broadband. It was a revelation to me, quite frankly. I'm, I, 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 I'm at home. My Sunday mornings is when, when, it, when I relax. I'm sitting in my, in chair, in, in my chair and, and reading the Internet and drinking a hot cup of coffee. And I'm reading about the digital divide. And I'm thinking, yeah, I've heard the term before, digital divide. And uh, I'm reading this article, and then it, 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 it dawns on me that they're talking about life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, and free broad broadband as being a, a, a right. It, it's, uh, there's a cost to this at the end, at the end user. Someone uh, at, the, at the council meeting with uh, the, the vendor that was in, uh, the vendor said hey, that the, the line goes right by, I think, 86 houses. And one of the council uh, 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 members asked, so those 86 will be able to hook up? And their response was very, very clear and telling. They said if they want to. It's expensive for them to then, for the property owner to want to uh, buy off on the 86 or $100 a month or whatever it is. So uh, the backbone is there throughout this county. The backbone is there. It's getting that last mile. 
is, 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 is just going to have to be economically feasible for um, an ISP to do. Right. Delegate Hartman. That was more or less my question. I wanted to know, would serve in the, the nine areas that you're mentioning in this RFP, once that's completed, would, how, how many more targeted areas or, or how many customers don't have it? What does this nine serve? If you give us some percentages or whatever as to, um, and then also just to mention with the four companies you're saying, there's four or five companies competing, and there's different technologies they're offering as well, which is good because if some are serving remote, there's something, a different application. So the technology is really improving as well as getting those customers served. So. It is. A absolutely. To that it's point. It's changing quickly. Yes. It, it, you know, I, 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 I've been known to say on occasion, humorously in my office, that uh, as we're working on the telegraph and Morse code, uh, the computer's being invented out there technology-wise. By the time that we can get broadband into through uh, all the pockets of this county, we're going to be lapped by Starlink, Amazon, that are putting the satellites in. It's not the old days of having a satellite at your house. This stuff is, is actually, we've used it temporarily at the airport. Uh, Starlink works. The satellite companies do work in some situations. Um, uh, uh, Delegate Hartman, to your point, uh, if we add up uh, our nine areas, uh, we're talking about 2,200 uh, users. Uh, so, uh, what that, where that fits in a, in a county of 103,000, I, I, I don't know. We've taken the maps that we know about. We've taken uh, uh, the maps that, that uh, this is a, a, another example of, of how uh, sometimes part of leadership is, when, is knowing when to say no. And we've had to say no from the county executive's office when it's come to uh, 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 broadband implementation as far as putting taxpayer money into it. Um, we've heard from, uh, from Maryland Broadband, we've heard from those that have come in uh, to, to, to council, uh, and, and they say uh, uh, the study. Uh, a year ago, we were looking at the possibility of doing a, uh, a, a speed study, as well as who has internet and who doesn't. Uh, other counties have spent 50 percent uh, uh, of matching funds to do that study, some in upwards of $50,000 to do the study. We heard just recently that they're getting ready to do uh, a, a grant proposal that the counties can do this for free. So if we, had, the point being is if we had done this a year ago, we, would have, we could possibly have spent $60,000 to identify areas that we already know about. Uh, but we would have yielded to pressure to do something on broadband. We hear it. We understand exactly what's going on on broadband, and we're on top of it. Okay, the last thing I'll say about this, because I think we need to move on, um, and I know I'm not running the meeting, but that's how I feel. Um, <laughs> You're right. After the 2,200 persons have been connected, if we can do that, mm -hmm. the non-target areas, can you provide us as a delegation, and I know you don't have that today, but how many more people are left in that needing that service? That's all I want to know. Okay. Thank I'll, you. I'll, I'll do my best to get that to you. Sure. Uh, needing the service and wanting the service to. I mean, have access. I mean, let's yeah. reality of it. We have a farming community. They use technology now, but they need the internet. Our, our EMS providers, they need the internet. So it's not almost just whether or not they want it, need it. It's almost a way of life. I, I understand. So that's all I'm going to say. Well, I, I just want to clarify you're making an inference about uh, agriculture and safety, two of my number one priorities. Uh, so, yes, we're, we're on top of it. We're looking at it. I don't want to neglect anybody or keep anybody from the safety or, or agriculture. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think the last comment, Senator Eckhart, did you have something? I'm good. You're good now. Okay. Um, yes, we have five issues left. Uh, there's been a lot of healthy debate on this topic, and um, I, I hope that we will progress further. Um, so thank you, everyone that... Uh, made a comment. Next, uh, we have the current coordinator. How did the legislators envision the role of the position? So the position, oh, do you, you want to go ahead and then I'll. 
So the way it was envisioned, and I'm not on that committee, uh, Delegate Hartman is, so I don't want to speak out of turn, but the way the written legislation states is that there would be a coordinator in each jurisdiction to assist the teachers, the superintendent, with making sure their teachers have that national board certification um, to what has been many years is shown that underserved communities, underserved areas, the teachers may um, ha want and need this certification to do more in their profession and to address the many um, uh, issues, that, or say, in the school system with working with teaching that they needed somebody to really look at that to be that support system. So Maryland State Department of Education has their coordinator, but then the, each jurisdiction would have one to assist in some of those underserved areas and address the needs of the teachers. That's the goal of what was written in the legislation. Uh, Delegate, did you have a comment on that? Well, first of all, I, I, I want to reiterate that I didn't support Kerwin for, for many reasons, and it takes away a lot of local control. Um, the board certification, the, I think we're going to see um, a, a long gap before the, the number of teachers that are, are nationally board certified. The process is, is pretty um, challenging. Um, in, I, from the teachers I've talked to, the master's, it, th this replaces the master's degree. So from what I understand, the, the master's degree will stay in place as far as their step up in salary and things like that. The board certification can add to that further for that, but the goals that are set forth in Kerwin for the National Board Certified, I think are very lofty to, to put it mildly. I think this implementation coordinator speaks to the, um, the implementation of the funding between the county, um, between the county and the public school system. So we had to do with the point an implementation coordinator so the question was, what did, what was the intent of creating legislation for the implementation coordinator? The, I mean, without having, <laughs> without having the specifics in front of me, I mean, the, the, the bill was several hundred pages thick. I, as far as the coordinator itself, I, it's not something I focused or, or, or dwelled on. I, I, I still have questions today, and I was on the committee. I mean, you know, the, the bill requires, um, you know, a certain amount of downtime for teachers and things like that. If you can't hire enough teachers, how are you going to provide additional teachers to create that downtime? I mean, there are just they're, 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 they're inherent flaws in the bill um, that I don't even know how a coordinator is going to fix when, you know, funding, I mean, as far as the, the increases for the teacher salary doesn't come until like 2025. Um, I think we're losing more, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just especially with the challenges you see um like coming to a county just create extra half days off you know just the the challenges are becoming greater um you know I, I don't know how this bill fixes things until we fix things that are left out of the bill such as discipline in the classroom and trying to encourage more people to go into the profession and and the funding and the salaries and so forth that's five years away so how can you tell somebody you know, hang in there, it's going to get better, and it, it's, it's so far out. Hopefully on the individual county basis, that starts to be stepped in, in phase, and we can start attracting more teachers and meeting the, the goals that are required in, in Kerwin. I, I personally don't know what you do um, <coughs> if you physically can't hire the people that are required to, to fulfill the bill. Well, that's the goal for retention and the salaries of the teachers increase to get that whole of teachers to stay. Right, that's What's what I said. I hope we start, we don't wait until, I mean, you know, the deadline comes. I'm, I hope we start implementing some some gradual increases to well, start. Actually, it is right now. Fiscal 2022 is an increase where it moves up to about $10,000 and it gets teachers at a different level to retain them. So that's what the bill says. But all, it comes in at 25, is the, um, isn't it ultimately in 25 the the full effect of the Kerwin salary? I believe that's correct. On page yeah. six is what I was right. referring to. I, I appreciate I, that for local planning. Sure. Senator Carraza had a... I'm just going to make just kind of general, just to kind of for the list, uh, for the viewers, and just um, hope, hoping that the general comments will be helpful for, for the purposes of planning at the local level. We have to take a step back. You have When you have a comprehensive bill like Kerwin that was passed, 
the, you know, it, we've already had, last year, we already passed a revisions bill on the first bill. So this is how comprehensive this legislation is. The, the reason I want to bring this up, it's not uncommon for us to go back. Um, you know, I also oppose um, the Kerwin bill because of the lack of local control and parental involvement and affordability. With that said, you know, we have, you know, it did pass. You're already looking at a second bill with these revisions and asking questions about that. I would encourage uh, the county, um, you know, working with um, some of the issues. Um, we have an Eastern Shore School Superintendents Association that brings up common issues for some of our rural counties on the shore. If there are issues specifically, uh, whether it has to do with the coordinator, with, with it has to do with you need more local flexibility, I would, you know, you're, you have strength in numbers with that association and with the other counties through MACO. So, you know, this is one, again, I'm on the Senate Education, Health and Environmental Affairs Committee and we spend, uh, you know, a lot of time on Kerwin, um, this revisions bill that just came in, it, it was a, a huge bill. For example, I was pushing to make sure that we did in-person school education, that we would actually do it in person and that amendment was successfully um, included. My point in, in saying that is if you have some specifics where you know that in order for this to be more workable at the local level, you know, you need to let us know on the early end and work and build kind of your own coalition of support for those recommendations. And that puts us in a position, whether it's on the Ways and Means Committee or the Senate Education, Health and Environmental Affairs Committee, to then really advocate for those local priorities dealing with Kerwin. So I know you had a specific issue, but I'm trying to kind of elevate it to say you're going to have multiple issues with this bill that you need to give us the feedback on how you can practically implement this at the local level. May, may I just add to that? Delegate. And echo and support what Senator Crows had to say. You know, at the end of the day, I think what everybody in the room here and every citizen in Wacomico County wants is every child that shows up in a classroom gets the very best education every day. My, my point, and I would support Senator Crows on this, is that those decisions are best left locally. Uh, Kerwin, just by the nature of saying we're going to have an implementation coordinator, uh, begs the question, what happens when the coordinator dis disagrees with the Board of Education? Now, for the past year and a half, two years, I've got to tell you, as a politician, as an elected official that's supposed to have the pulse of the citizens, people and moms and dads are very critical of our public education system for only one reason, that they want to be able to have input and control over the education of their children. So I can't answer that question. What does the legislator envision for the role of the position? Because probably when they created it, it was before COVID. <laughs> I got to tell you, we, we, I think, would be well advised as a legislature to revisit the role of parents, the role of the Board of Education, and if there's going to be a coordinator, making sure that that coordinator can work cooperatively locally, even if we keep a statewide mandate in place. I don't know how you get there. Um, unlike the electrician's bill where Johnny and I, that was our committee of jurisdiction, this one is not. But I have to believe that the legislature is up to the task because uh, it is a major issue nationally, and we know it. Us politicians know it. And, we, and it should act accordingly. And I think that got, kind of got misconstrued. The question at hand was the coordinator for a part of that legislation. It wasn't to implement uh, Kerwin. That's not what they're being hired for. It's specifically to assist and retain those teachers. Right, in that yeah. position. Okay, that's no, what I was looking for. No, it was the implementation coordinator to implement Kerwin. Not, not the Okay, well, that wasn't how it was. Oh. Right. Any more questions or comments on that? Right, moving on. Um, next, we have um, the Senate Vaccine Committee update. Can someone I touch on that? that uh, I'm, I'm the only senator on the <laughs> Senate Vaccine Committee, so I'll give you the update. So that would be you then? Yeah, it would be. And thank you very much. Um, the Senate President designated a number of us to sit and meet on a regular basis from the beginning of COVID, and we're still meeting just as to get a report from the Secretary of Health and also to get the legislative numbers on the rollout, uh, the status of testing, and now we're into vaccinations. So 
we've divided up, the department is divided up into four focus areas. One is to focus on the unvaccinated because we still have a significant number of folks who are unvaccinated and we're not to the point of getting immunity. And we can't maintain that. We're going to continue to have an issue if we don't get folks vaccinated. Some of our rural counties are, are folks who are resisting vaccination. So it's how do we get the information? How does the state get the information out there? And how do we move forward to get more people vaccinated on a regular basis? 66% of folks who come into our ER, ERs with significant COVID symptoms and ultimately result in death are the unvaccinated population. Folks will say, well, we've got 40 some percent, 44% of vaccinated who are getting sick. So what's that all about? Well, as long as you have the population not completely immunized, you're gonna have variations on the coronavirus floating around. The next issue is the booster. Um, we are now, the booster's been rolled out. We're still awaiting hearing about Moderna and Pfizer, but the other is out and eligibility is the big issue. So if you are, what, 65 or older, you're eligible to get the booster, or if you work in a high-risk area, which pretty much qualifies anybody, because if you're out and around in the public, you should be able to get that booster six months after you've had your second COVID shot. And oh, by the way, get a flu shot too, and you can get them both the same day if you go to the right place. So that will continue to take place. So mm -hmm. they are really working hard to set up more and more clinics and outposts to be able to get that done. You know, this past week, um, authorization was given to be able to vaccinate kids five to 12, and that's a reduced amount of what the adult dose is, and that's being implemented as we st speak through the health departments through school clinics, and there was a lot of discussion this week because we had our COVID meeting the other day about why wasn't the state setting up more clinics or providing that ex those vaccines in the schools through school-based wellness centers. And I think they are beginning to do that. Most of the time it's been done through the health department, through the pharmacies. So you will see more of that rolling out. And then the other issue is the ongoing availability of testing. Most of you all know, maybe or don't know, that you can get take home COVID tests. Yes. So my suggestion is get them either from your physician or the health department or the pharmacy and keep them at home, um, case in point. I don't sound so good today, but I'm negative, trust me. <laughs> I think I just saw where the library was yeah. giving the those out. They have them at a yeah. sorting yeah. branch. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there's a lot of activity going on. So we are not going to really get things back to normal. And this is taking a toll on everybody. You talk about that. Uh, interestingly enough, still the high area where folks are getting sick or in those middle mm -hmm. ages and more kids than before. So it's really important. 98% of our seniors are vaccinated and have boosters. So that's the good news. But we still have a lot of people in between to be able to get that word out. And as many of you know, I've been working with the vulnerable populations group to be able to make sure we are able to have maintain the equity, make sure that all of our communities have access to testing, have access to vaccines, and that you've got a good group here on the ground in Wicomic County and the Lower Shore that have been working diligently mm -hmm. on that. Um, the other thing we've had a big discussion about is that how overloaded um, with sick people, our physicians' offices have been here on the shore around the state, 
and then the overload on our hospital delivery system has been absolutely massive. So there's been a lot of triage, there are a lot of unhappy folks out there who've had COVID, who've had to be sent out of the area just because of the triage, severity of symptoms, the needs of the ventilators, um, and whether or not you need them, um, the additional meds to be able to interrupt the whole coronavirus course. So we get that on a probably an every four week basis to have that update. So I'll be glad to provide any of that data if you want those PowerPoints. Okay, any questions? I have a real quick update. Mr. McCain. Uh, just before we came into the meeting, the FDA actually okay. authorized the emergency use of Moderna and Pfizer boosters. Okay. Okay. And at the CDC's meeting this afternoon, so there, okay. there's a possibility literally by this afternoon it'll be available, to, the booster will be available to everyone. Okay. Yeah, that was the big question. Why can't people who, to the state from our group, why can't anybody who wants a booster get a booster? And if you really look at the CDC guidelines, I mean, it's all a matter of um, timing um, and how much of that booster vaccine you're getting locally to be able to, because you've got to use your target population first. But once that's been released, we'll get more that will flow down into our communities. Right. Ms. Bradley? Yes, I just wanted to add what uh, Senator Eckert said. Uh, Hebron has been participating in the Vulnerable Task Force for quite some time now, I think about 18 months so far. And um, I would highly recommend if uh, any of our other municipalities would like to um, reach out to them. Uh, Hebron coordinated with them to have an event during one of our standard car shows that have been going on annually. Um, we were able to have the health department and Tidal Health there to give um, shots, uh, COVID shots, boosters, and flu shots. I think Tidal Health did the flu shots. Um, so we actually had quite a few people that were served and identified five who had not been vaccinated at all. Wasn't it f 58 that had not been vaccinated? Wow. 58, I'm sorry, um, I was off a little bit, but 58 that had not had their first vaccination and we were able to, to help uh, facilitate that. So if you have any holiday events coming up and you wanna reach out to the Vulnerable <coughs> Task Force and coordinate with them, um, they can help arrange to have those mobile units um, come to the um, event where you can have a, a, a larger reach for your um, citizens. All right, any more questions or comments? I, just, I have a question on how this is gonna impact us locally. Um, you know, we see, we have healthcare professionals leaving the field because they don't want to be vaccinated. Uh, Title Health has 14 admitting positions that are leaving at the end of December because they refuse to be vaccinated. We have teachers leaving the profession. Um, we have first responders leaving because they don't want to be vaccinated. So I'm wondering if there's going to be any mandatory with either school age children or healthcare professionals, even county employees have pushed back they don't want to be vaccinated. And how we're going to how we're going to deal with this locally that we're losing losing professionals. Yes. I think it's important to get accurate information out there. A lot of people are getting information from sources that really aren't grounded in the research and the facts that are coming down through the CDC and through even our local physicians on the ground. And that's what's important. Uh, we have pushed back um, as assure on the mask mandate and on vaccines mandate because we believe that folks can get the information they need and make reasonable, good, sound decisions that benefit themselves and the community. And so we pride ourselves on making sure that folks have good information and trust that they are going to make good decisions. I have to fight in that Senate vaccine committee every time we meet against a mandate because the Western Shore folks would like nothing and all of our folks who are Johns Hopkins public health officials who are also legislators believe this should have been mandated right out of the gate, that everybody should be vaccinated. And we're trying to hold off on that. I mean, the issue is, if you don't get a, a, most of the people vaccinated, you don't get immunity and you interrupt the virus's course. 
and that's the information that needs to get around so that folks do understand immunity and do understand the importance and significance of vaccination. I mean, and we've done this years ago. With, we expect kids to come to school vaccinated. And that's kept us from having outbreaks of polio, chicken pox, we get occasional measles, mumps, whooping cough. You get some of that out and around, but because most people get immunized, with all this pushback on not immunizing, we're seeing an increase in kids not being immunized, which is only going to aggravate infections in the community going forward. So it's really important that folks get accurate information. The health department is a good resource. Our hospitals are good resources. And there are knowledgeable physicians, all of us. I've been so overloaded with all of the information coming down from whether it's Professional Nurses Association, from Physicians Association, all of the information. It's just a matter of getting it out there. Unfortunately, there's a, you know, with everything that floats around the internet, it's hard to know who to believe. And I think that's what we're confronted with. There's such a, a pushback on anything that comes out that we're in a very difficult time. And Senator, you'll be relieved to know to that point about accurate information. We've been recently advised by the county health officer that they are not putting tracking devices in uh, the COVID-19 vaccinations. That surfaces every now and then, yeah. Well, I, I, I appreciate your information. I'm not a physician, and I, I don't advise people on whether to get a vaccine or not. Um, but I do think it's important that they talk to their physician and decide right. what's right for them and their children. But I think the mandates you're referring to are coming from the federal level. For example, like Medicare, I understand. No, I'm for talking the, about the Senate vaccine. Yeah, but you're, you were talking about teachers leaving, um, medical professionals leaving. I think yes, the, it, the mandates are coming from the federal level impacting health care workers. It, it, it's going to it's going to impact everybody. It, 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 take the county uh, uh, to the councilwoman's uh, uh, point. It is affecting our, our, our county employee because the OSHA mandate. You know, we we see it as uh, our, my office sees it as an overreach. We're trying to see. We're waiting to see what is going to happen most likely out of the Supreme Court as to whether it's going to be a requirement. 100 employees are over. But the employees don't know, and this is this is being played out uh, countywide, uh, statewide, and, na and nationally. But it's having an effect because people aren't getting clear information as to, well, I, my employer has over 100 employees. Are they going to tell me I have to get a, a, a vaccination, or every week I'm going to have to pay for that testing? That, that's a difficult position to put the employee in, and it's going to have an impact financially on the taxpayer. So what is the process in the public school to mandate a vaccine? Is there a process legislatively that you need to go through to mandate kids to ha be vaccinated for something? Well, it's just a given. I think it's going to become part of the routine with all the other immunizations that you have to have to be able to come to school. Mm -hmm. so. With that said, um, I've gotten like three or four requests to uh, take a, a break, and I saw a couple people getting up, um, and I see people getting antsy. So we can take a quick five-minute break. Uh, we have a couple more questions. Hopefully, we'll get done by 12. Okay, next on the uh, topic list is Wicomico water, sewer, water and sewer expansion and connectivity for failing septic systems. Does anybody want to? touch on that mr. Hastings I'll just add I'll put this on the uh, this particular topic on the agenda just because I thought it would be something that we should all uh, really think about at least for Wicomico County as most folks know you know 30 years ago we were building a lot of homes on you know cornfield subdivisions and, and the like all on septic systems and, and of course most of the useful life for any septic system is usually 30 years so we're going to have a, we, you know, we have a quiet tsunami of failures that are happening, some of which we've, you know, we've dotted out, and that's only because, you know, we know that someone's going to sell their home or that there's a real issue. But the truth be told, there's so many failing septic systems that are barely operating. 
we're not going to go back to those days of building those kinds of cornfield subdivisions or anything like that on septic system. So we really need to hook up as many uh, homes as possible, not only for a water quality standpoint, but um, you know, there's a lot of people uh, that, that are now going to sell their homes and, and finding out that they've got a $30,000 uh, difference in what they thought they were going to get in their home value. So as much as humanly possible, I think uh, if, our, if our collective groups, I was thinking of the municipalities especially, especially, we need to continue to focus on expansion where we can, hooking up homes that are nearby within um, municipalities, I'm looking at Heverin or, <laughs> or other kind of, uh, or other areas. But uh, we, we've now gone through the process. I think everyone knows uh, to the county, Acting County Executive's Office has moved forward a, uh, 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 our own kind of bill. Actually, the county, we kind of uh, actually did address it. This is a plan. We went through the long process to develop a water sewer master plan, or I guess uh, suggestions for the plan to fix the plan. Long story made short, we really need to address this. I don't, this is going to be, uh, this is not something that we're going to address overnight, but this is going to be something that is, uh, we're going to need all hands on deck to be able to, uh, to hook up as many uh, systems as possible. And, and the water side of that, I'll just be brief and say, you know, a couple years ago we had the issue with uh, the trichlorocycline and others that are in the water. I don't doubt that the other part of the county where there are chemicals or something in the water, that's the, we also need to go through public water for some areas, including, uh, uh, so I'll leave it at that and just open up the floor, but I wanted to be able to get debate so that we can start talking about funding sources so we can help address it as quickly as possible. You brought up some good points, Councilman Hastings. Senator Eckhart. Thank you very much, and I would say this is one of the things that I've been talking a lot about for the past four or five years. And you've got that plan, that is great, but what we need to start doing is working with the municipalities and with the county to be able to identify projects and begin to go down the road and work with, um, you have um, federal monies that are available, you have state monies that can be available. Yes, there will be monies locally that will um, be a part of that mix, but in identifying the priority of the projects. I mean, I know, and I'm gonna give my two cents here. I would love to see us uh, figure out how we do some kind of a municipal <coughs> neighborhood wastewater treatment down Nanakoke Road. We've got Whitehaven, you've got a number of places. And hopefully that's part of a uh, possibility in that draft plan. But then to be able to make some deliberate steps, take those steps to begin to identify the funding and get it. The ARI monies that are coming down a lot of those can be used. There's a wastewater pot, there's a water pot, and then there's a general pot of money. Mm -hmm. And you could put together a number of resources, and we certainly can work with you on that. I know years ago, the regional councils looked at, when we first started, we looked at a comprehensive wastewater treatment system for parts of the shore. And that might be a possibility, too, that we go through our regional councils in addition to be able to identify funding for some of these projects, whether you're talking about the water pot or the wastewater treatment. I do believe we need plan and listing those priorities so we can keep moving those, because you're going to hear me bark a lot, Josh. Um, up in Annapolis about. I really would like to see funding go to deal with some of our failing bit ponds, failing septics before we start dipping into those Chesapeake Bay restoration right. funds for other things. Mm -hmm. right. And as, as you on the priority list. As you know, we have um, accepted the um, consultant's plan on water and sewer, and um, you mentioned the regional councils. The um, Tri-County Council does have this on their radar screen, so um, one of the big issues right now is funding, so I'm glad you brought that up. Senator. Um, well, I want to commend uh, Wicomico County um, for moving forward with this master plan because what we were all doing is bringing our individual, whether it was a municipality or, you know, individual issues, and Wicomico County said, look, we need a master plan, and that's the way we really leverage the funding. Um, so when I was looking, I know it's a 300-page document, and mm -hmm. I, I saw that you um, identified out of the gate um, it looks like um, Allen, Nanticoke, Parsonsburg, Powellville, Quantico, Whitehaven. 
Um, those were identified out of the box, I'm assuming, because of the research that was done yeah. uh, with the plan. Uh, so that's helpful to know, but it would also be helpful for us to know in the other areas that didn't make this list how it's going to yeah. be coordinated and built out. Even so, um, yes, you know, we want to work with you on this master plan, um, and we want to leverage the Tri County Council for sure. Right. Uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I would. I would. I would compliment the executive uh, on this plan together with George Miles and Bureau. This is one of the best plans I think I've seen as far as taking initiatives, uh, being extremely comprehensive. You can acquire this if you go to like Comco County website. You can download it. Yeah. Uh, we would email it to you, but it's too large to send as a PDF attachment. So we would encourage everyone to. Um, is that correct, Mrs. Hurley? Where they can go online. And they can. The they can. Yes. Yes. yes, you can download it from our website. You can see the entire plan. Uh, John has done an excellent job in putting this together, together with George Miles and Bureau. It's very comprehensive, and we are looking towards Addy. I know we've had talk before about funding. We're looking forward to working with the state to make things happen here. Senator, do you have another comment? No. I uh, oh, I, I thought I saw your hand go no, up. When, when you are getting ready to go and let's bring all the parties together and sit down and absolutely the DE and health department and start so, j j it. just for clarification and I appreciate that and again this is an outstanding form so that we yeah. all get on the same page that uh, um, uh, what we're doing is we are engaging MDE um, uh, secretary MDE uh, we, we're engaging Maryland Department of Planning uh, the Maryland Department of Health uh, our staff the council, uh, we, we are all on the same page as to get this done. The first thing that I can see uh, that we need help with is uh, making sure that we get permitting in the areas that we're talking about. That is number one. We can't do anything unless we get permitting to do what it is we want to do in those areas. So with, uh, as you'll see in that plan, when, when you look at it, those areas have already been identified through the first uh, round of uh, uh, applications uh, made last year that identified some of those projects, Mardella being one of them. Uh, uh, thank you very much for coming in. Uh, our, our, uh, another tact on this is not only going to be going to those on-site uh, on uh, disposal systems that are failing, uh, those that are non-conforming, but also those that are close to the municipalities that the state is saying, hey, look, taxpayer money has, has been spent to, to increase capacity in your wastewater treatment plants. We want to see urban growth, or, or we want to see growth going to the urban core. We want to see some of these uh, uh, failing septic systems to be tied into uh, 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 existing municipal wastewater treatment plants. So as we're looking at uh, uh, taking care of these failing systems out throughout the county, we have a parallel track to work with the municipalities uh, and engage them and, and, and get their assistance in taking care of those uh, the, those uh, uh, failing systems that are close to, to their borders, and these are these is working this is working within their comprehensive plans, their comprehensive growth plans. We're not stepping on anybody's toes. We're we're trying to say, hey, you know, let's all work together here, and we're going to get this done. Good. Could, could I could I ask the county to email us that link so I could sure easily I find that? Have. I think you just go to White County County.org. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, You'll find the link. I think they already it, sent it. I did send it. Yeah, yeah. I've got. Well, there you go. <laughs> and we can do it again I'll if you need it. We've had no, that's okay. All right. Yes, sir. If, if I may, uh, when we were doing the introductions, I let you know that I was the town manager in Pittsfield, the grants administrator for Willers and Sharptown. So I'm not going to talk, speak for those two, but I can for Pittsville. And um, one of the things I will say is that when the county started this process, they did reach out to the to the municipalities for input to sure. see whether the the towns were will, will, were willing to or wanted to assist in the process. Uh, in Pittsburgh, we the county had come to us initially about us expanding. Uh, we're in the midst of of uh, next couple of years of upgrading, going to a new wastewater treatment plant with higher allocation. We were actually looking at that uh, before the county came, and then when the county came to us a while back, we were willing to participate in that and actually build a plant that would accommodate outside areas so we would reach out. Later in the study, the county decided no, that Pittsville was okay, they were going to go in another direction, which is fine. What we've done in, for our town is that instead of going for a higher allocation, we're going to go for a little bit lower allocation. But you've got to bear in mind that the, there's grant funding for repairs, 
the upgrades to your plant. But for expansion, you've got to go for loans. So that, that was something that we had to look at. Of course, at the present time, we got two things going on in the town, which is uh, we're actually upgrading both our water treatment plant and our wastewater treatment plant at the present level and the present discharge permit. But we also have a grant from USDA to look at uh, going to a, a major, a bigger plant. But we're not going to be going to the size that we initially thought because we're figuring the county's got other options that they're going to be using. That's a very good point, Judge. So uh, coming from a municipal background, I know how expensive uh, a wastewater treatment plant uh, is or, or treating, treating a, uh, a wastewater is. Uh, what's going to happen in uh, municipalities such as Joe's, uh, uh, it's going to become so expensive to run these plants. So mm -hmm. we can see, we, we can project forward as we continue to get uh, farther down the road in our implementation plan, we can, we can help uh, Pittsville out. Uh, uh, we can help Mardella out. We can help uh, these, these uh, other municipalities save cost in their superintendent's licensing, in, in, the, in the licensing for, for the uh, discharge permits. It, it, we're going to save them down the road, uh, and, and, and that, that will help motivate that we're all in this together and, and we can get it done, mm -hmm. absolutely. All right. Uh, Any more comments? Question. Speaker? Uh, sure. Of the funds that can be used, do you already have an idea of how much of that you'll be able to benefit from? I guess I'm just trying to get an understanding. Which, with which the, ones? With the ARP money um, and any other monies that have been identified, that's a, like that, how that, much that, That's a very good at? question. Okay. Again, with, with the American Rescue Plan money, uh, that's two tranches, $10 million this year, $10 million next year. We have a general fund operating budget of $161 million. So $10 million over $161 doesn't go as far as it used to. So we're, we're making sure that we do what we can and best safeguard that, that, uh, that $10 million or $20 million over, over the course of the next uh, three or four years. As far as it relates to implementing it in the infrastructure, uh, we, the, the, uh, the first thing the plan calls for is we have to uh, uh, get permitting, identify these areas, get uh, um, uh, go to MDE on a priority list, and then we find out the funding. That's, that's at least a year or two down, down the road. Uh, so as far as implementing any or using any part of that ARP money for uh, water and sewer at this time, um, uh, we're not considering it, to be frank. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. right. I just want to say that permit's going to, permitting is going to take a year. I mean, let us know. I mean, that sounds like that should be yeah, too not, long. Yeah, not, not the permitting, the identifying the, the, the project list. For example, uh, let's take Mardella. We did uh, every year um, uh, municipalities and, and the county make application to MDE and say, this, these are what our projects are. This is what we'd like to, to, to get funded. We want to do an expansion. We want to get a, uh, a, a new water tower. Uh, then MDE looks at it and they will rate the projects. I right. believe last year there was like 160 some projects yeah. that, that municipalities uh, put that governments put in for, and then they were they were scored. Mm -hmm. um, so you put those in in January, they come out in ju in June. This year they didn't come out till heck, it was almost September or October. Mm -hmm. So that's just to get to see where you fall on that list and what percentage possibly of grant money that you may you may. Uh, 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 apply for. Then you have the legislative process that you have to identify, you have to go to your councils and, and you know, it, so you're easily talking years. So, so to better use the American Rescue Plan money, we, we, we've got that over, if there, was a, if there was a project right this minute that we could use for water and so there, there was an identifiable project, uh, absolutely we would consider using that. Okay, we'll have that conversation because I have that list too. And we'll take a look at that. Thank you. Delegate Mouse, did you have a comment? I said, are we on the first one or the second one? Say that again. Oh, we're, on, we're doing both. Do I, we, we can do them both together, actually. Um, did you have a comment? I do my only comment to add to this conversation with the Bay Restoration Fund. Yes. Yes. The only comment I had to add was just the Bay Restoration Fund. And, um, uh, you know, last session was COVID, so it was hard for, for everybody to be involved. Um, you know, that comes up again this session. I encourage all the, um, everybody to be involved and to voice your opinion about protecting those monies for wastewater uh, improvements. Sure. And, and um, does anyone from the state know if any 
funding figures have um, uh, been distributed to the state, do we know, from the infrastructure bill that was just signed? Nobody knows no, yet. No, not yet. No, we'll get that quickly. And the one thing I do want to ask, you know, we have a lot of people in the county who have the failing septic systems, and they some, they look to the county sometimes for some um, subsidizing, some assistance, and I know we have the state program that provides that. Um, would any of the current funds that's available be able to assist these people that are on this waiting list for the county to get some type of assistance if they're eligible? Uh, yes, my understanding, uh, 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 I don't have the figures in front of me, but to, to that uh, grant funding that you're talking about, we have helped uh, individuals out. Uh, oh, yeah, we've yeah, a lot, and yeah. I'm and thankful for it, but yeah. there's some that are still waiting on a waiting list, and I was just curious if that was like an immediate thing that we could possibly Yeah, I, 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 I don't have that, but I will look into it. That's okay, it. thanks. Right. Anyone else from the municipalities? Any council members? All right. Um, is there any more comments on water and sewer? That was very quick. Um, school safety. Um, Mr. Holloway, did you have any questions on that? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll put this on here. Um, you know, I'm hearing from a lot of parents um, about school safety and some of the issues that's going on in the schools. Here, about three weeks ago, we had a student that um, attacked a um, law enforcement officer in the school um, attacked other people and apparently when the news came out this student had been escorted off the school grounds over a dozen times in the past three years now when a parent or teacher comes to me and says what are we going to do about this I mean how far do we have to go what has to happen before a student like this is removed from the system. Now we know, we know we want all the students to get the best education they can. We know that. That's where schools are there for. And in a lot of cases, you know, some students can be reformed or what, whatever words you want to be used, you know. But when you have a student like this, what, what does the state say? How far does it have to go? Does somebody have to die first? before that student's finally incarcerated or whatever happens. Now this was a very, very dramatic event for everybody that was in that room that day. Now you can't keep a child from bringing a gun to school if they get a hold of one at home, you know, they get there. We had that happen a few days ago and they, thankfully they found it and nothing happened. But when you have the warning or the warnings that they've had with this, this particular student how, how long does that student have to stay in the school system? We were talking about teacher retention a while ago. I've had teachers come into my store and say, you know, I've gone to work at a private school. Well, you're not making the money now that you were then. No, but at least I can teach and it's safe. You know, that, that's, I think money is a big thing with teachers, but I think a lot of it is, is, are they safe when they go to school? And parents don't feel safe sending their kids to school. That's true. So, is there anything coming up? Is there anything going to be put in that we can ensure the safety? And when somebody goes that far, like this student had, that that person's not going to be back in that school causing more problems? That's a tough question, I know. Well, but it, I think it's something so that's on a lot of people's would, minds. We, we have talked specifically about this issue in my committee, as well as I've had one-on-one -on -one conversations with each one of the school superintendents um, in my three counties, and um, obviously including Dr. Hanlon. On a, on a general level, just on the issue of school safety, I think it's important that um, the counties and the municipalities know that there is a Maryland School Safety Center that was established after the shootings, um, if you'll recall, about three years ago. And the, the Maryland School Safety Center has been the um, the center that is providing the training for the school resource officers um, and the support there. I want to make sure that we, this issue of supporting school resource officers was brought up today because last legislative session we had uh, members of the Maryland General Assembly introduce legislation to actually eliminate 
school resource officers. I would urge Wicomico County to get on the record um, in support of your school resource officers. More to be proactive, so if um, that legislation were to be introduced again, you're already on record that you're, you're opposed to it. I also wanted to remind people that the training for the school resource officers is, is focused on counseling, de-escalation, to do everything they can to avoid a, an arrest. So we know that that's the goal, is, is to, to use every other um, tool possible uh, to de-escalate counseling um, to address the situation. The situations that you're talking about is when it's beyond that point. And, and these are the conversations that how do you protect the rest of the students and the school personnel uh, when you have basically one student who has had uh, repeat uh, offenses? And from number one, I believe it goes again back locally. You know, are, are we locally, um, you know, do, do we have a school superintendent, a school board that says we want to look at maybe that student's removed from that classroom and not removed from school altogether, but, you know, you're protecting the rest of the students, but you're also trying to deal with the issues of that one student. <clears throat> so you're absolutely right as far as identifying those situations where, you know, you may have to have a student removed. The question is, how do you work through that locally? So I'm not going to um, say that there's some magic bullet with legislation. I keep going back to what I believe that we have to do on all of these challenging issues with education, whether it's mask mandates, um, discipline. It comes back to local control and also, I would say, early involvement of our parents. Not just parental involvement, but early um, involvement. So I would like, we should continue this, but we should also continue this with our school superintendents and our boards of education before kind of taking it back to the state committees of jurisdiction. Joe, did you have something before Delegate Harmon? No. Go ahead. If I can add earlier, when I talked about Kerwin, I, I mentioned one of the shortcomings I feel in Kerwin is that it didn't address discipline in the schools, which is one of the biggest problems I think, you know, that leads to our teacher retention. Um, but the comforting thing is, as Senator Crows had mentioned, there was actually a bill brought in that would have eliminated the school resource officers. And I think we found that, that you know, there, there were, that was an issue that didn't have any party lines. I think both sides uh, felt strongly, at least the leadership in my committee. Now our leadership is changing this year and hopefully the mindset on that doesn't change, but it, it was it was across the board. People um, felt strongly about keeping our school resource officers in the schools. So that was, a, you know, hopefully a bill that we, we don't see back, but comforting to know um, there was support on both sides of the aisle um, for, for killing that bill. Um, with regards to that bill, um, yes, your committee's changing, and the individual that supported it, Delegate Atterbury, she has now come to the mindset that the bill may be designed just for Howard County because Local. in our leadership, it's divided. <laughs> I'm not going to support <laughs> taking school resource officers right, that's out what I'm of there was support yeah, from but I was Democrats just saying, and Republicans. It very my well concern could come is back with the leadership and, changing. And it very well could come back because the initiator of that school resource officer bill was from Montgomery County. Um, so it may come back, but I just want to just, you know, put in place that our, our leadership is not you know pushing it for the entire state but then to answer your question uh, mr holloway i believe it does rest with the administrators of these individual school buildings as well as naturally from the superintendent and the board members that makes those decisions to really be tough on those things on those issues i mean this is not nothing new salisbury middle school has been very challenging for numerous years and to um, worry about whatever the numbers they need to state report. At the end of the day, I think that's irrelevant. We need these kids to be safe. We need these parents to be safe, uh, the teachers to be safe in these schools. So I almost rather have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Board of Ed and their administrators to say, look, this isn't gonna be and should not be overlooked. I had a parent, last thing I'll say is I had a parent 
from Fruitland Intermediate just the other day. She had called multiple, multiple times, gone out to the school to ensure that her <coughs> son uh, would stop getting hit by this other kid. Nothing had gotten done. So she, she felt as though it was necessary to go to the Fruitland Police. And, and you know, I think there's some things that can be done prior to getting that far to so address it and deal with it. Well, I understand what you're saying about local control and parents getting involved, but right now we've got a, we've got a school board that won't even let parents come to the meetings. So that's a problem. But local control most of the time is overridden by state law. And that's what you hear from the board members. Oh, we can't do anything. State law says this or state law says that. So that, that's, that's what we hear. So that's why I brought the question up. I mean, we're being told by board members that they can't do anything about it, that the law is this child has to be in the school. You know? And then we hear from parents that we go to a board meeting and they won't let us in and speak. So we can't have local control that way. Can I Mr. Cannon was next. I was going to say briefly, uh, Sheree, uh, it wasn't that long ago that Lacombe County's Board of Education uh, was actually uh, being investigated by the judiciary because of the fact that they did try to address discipline issues and the judiciary was accusing them of, of going too far and of overreach in disciplinary matters. So I think, you know, with, you, you are 100% correct that locally, you know, they, need, they do need to address it, but I don't think... Uh, we can overlook the fact that there's no doubt that at a higher level it's being scrutinized when we attempt to try to, to do the best we can on a local level. Ms. Oh, Bradley yeah. and then Delegate um, Mounts. <laughs> um, yes, I just wanted to point out that um, a lot of these children have mental health or behavioral issues that are happening in the schools and I know the school board is very dedicated to, to working with parents and with the county because they have a local care team coordinator that we have in each district across the state of Maryland that deals specifically with children who have these types of repetitive behaviors to try and wrap them around services within the community. So that might be a tool, um, uh, maybe a place to start um, is with that local care team because it's, it's very similar to um, um, the, the um, DSS team um, but without the CPS side of it. So it has all of those important agencies at the table. The parents are invited to the table. They come. Um, oftentimes, the school principal and the teachers are there. If there's an IEP, whoever's involved with the IEP comes. And they try and wrap them and connect them and give them warm handoffs to other services that are in the county. So that's definitely a tool that, that could be utilized. So if, if parents are calling and having these issues, that might be a referral that could be made because there are lots of, of programs within Wicomico County that can help address it before it gets to the step where we're, we're talking about incarcerating children. Delegate Mounts. And just very quickly, if, um, if we get a list of what the state's doing that's lim or yeah. preventing the yeah. local jurisdiction, Board of Ed, principals, whatever, that we had those, that would be very helpful. I've had conversations with um, superintendents and principals about that, and I, I hear that oftentimes, and I say, well, please tell me what they are so we can argue about them. Just when you have those conversations, that would be very helpful for us. So I know we're over our time. I'm yes. Uh, Senator? Uh, I'll be very brief to wrap up and to follow up on Delegate Mounts' point, but also some of us did press on school discipline as part of the Kerwin um, to, to include that, and we were not successful. However, we talked earlier in this meeting about you continue to look at revisions and where you have to go back and make corrections. So if we, I think in answer, instead of punning is it local, is it state, we do need the local examples in order for us to address it if it, if it does need to be addressed at the state level. I, I do agree with the speaker pro tem that I think we could, um, give a little bit more. I think there is more flexibility that we have at the local level that we can use in those situations and we need to use that local flexibility. If that local flexibility isn't there and we need to look at something and some type of, again, a revision to Kerwin to allow for those specific situations where you need to address a certain students who's threatening the, the, you know, the lives of the other students or is a risk, then we, then we need those examples at Delegate Mounts. I also just wanted to, for your viewers and for all of you, to remind you that there is a Maryland school safety tip line mm -hmm. that is anonymous and free. Uh, it, the number is 1-833-MDB-SAFE, but the number itself is 1-833-632-7233. Again, 
uh, you know, you want to use every tool that's available. They put these tip lines out there. So, you know, maybe, maybe somebody had an inkling. You never know, but they might have been fearful of reporting it. So, again, another tool to try to keep um, our students and our school personnel safe. Right. And to the speaker, uh, Pro Tem's point, um, Mr. Stauffer is in the house. They don't mean to point him out, but he's there taking notes. And I'm sure at the next quarterly um, work session, this topic will be brought up again with the board. So um, with that said, I know we're uh, running behind. Um, I, I want to thank the um, delegates and the senators that took their time to meet with us this morning. Also, the um, municipalities. I had a discussion with Delegate um, Anderton about bringing you all to the table. And it's always been my goal to work more with you all hand in hand. So I, I, I hope you reach out to the other municipalities and try to get them to our next meeting that we have with you all. So um, Senator, one last thing. Yeah, and I would say thank you for bringing everybody to the table. And if we could go back to doing this at least twice a year, I think that's helpful, maybe once after session yes and then once before i agree so we can um identify the priorities and keep moving together with them will be very helpful thank you delegate councilman holloway i think the state does require if they took their mask off they'd be home for five days so the other students would be safe yeah, okay <laughs> take it first first uh, first line of defense get the mask off right anything else all right, thank you all. This concludes this meeting with the delegation and the uh, municipalities. Thank you.